and I will ask Jed to come on stage from from uh, Rakuten Rapid API. Just and just when uh, um, during the, the time Jed is, is setting up, just a quick question because. I've been, uh, I'm, I'm a co-author of a report called the State of Banking APIs, right, that we publish every year, uh, that you can find on EPIT's website. But uh, traveling all over the world, talking to banks and regulators, sometimes they find that sometimes uh, a more, let's say, uh, a more directive regulation can be better because it's easier to follow. But some other may think that a regulation that just gives pr general principles is better because it gives the industry freedom to uh, to integrate the way they want, right? To integrate the, the specification. And so, uh, for example, I've w I was in Australia, and in Australia, the people I talked to say that they they prefer to follow the Open Banking UK standard because they're a little bit more directive than PSD2, which is it's just more general. So, so just a quick poll here uh, from this industry: uh, Who thinks it's better to have more directive regulations to follow for banks? Right? More directive, okay. Who thinks it's better to have a more freedom, less directive, but less prone to interpretation? Okay, and half of the room doesn't care. Yeah. Okay, but that's the that's the hard job of regulations, right? It's managing uh, the three the side of this. Thank you for uh, answering that, and I will ask you just to uh, have a. A strong applause for Jed, who comes from uh, Japan, right? Rapid and Rapid API for a talk about value and API economy. Thank you. Thanks, Mehdi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, value in the API economy from the perspective of what it is that we do. I'm going to start off by showing this statistic, 10.3%. This comes from the first statistically conducted study examining the effects of API adoption on end prices. So many of, you in, many of you represent organizations that are operating at similar size and scale as the companies in this study. So think about what 10.3% adds to your uh, market cap. And we see many ways that APIs add value. Um, and here are some examples. For companies like Salesforce and Twitter, it was about turning a product into a platform by letting third parties build complementary services on top. In the case of AWS, it let them move from infrastructure up to like higher level services and effectively capture a higher share of wallet and create customer stickiness around their service ecosystem. Uh, in the case of Best Buy, that's one of my favorite examples. It was a digital bridge, an enabler that let them move from an offline brick and mortar retail business into powering things like rewards programs. And we see many, many other ways. Um, internally, it can be about your, helping your organizations facilitate data flows. You abstract complex code into like simple calls. Uh, and in that way, you drive uh, cross use and better ROI on your IT investments. Externally, the stuff I'm personally pretty excited about is that public APIs offer a vector for your organizations to build best of breed applications. What you're doing there is like turning an external developer force into um, an extension of your development capabilities. Uh, it can also be a source of powerful data, which I want to spend just 30 seconds or, or maybe a minute on, with an example uh, about Amazon and how API adoption helped inform a vertical integrations strategy. So in 2002, uh, Jeff Bezos had a big mandate around API adoption in the company. And let's presume that this helped facilitate data flows in the organization. So in 2013, Amazon e-commerce business had 2 million third-party sellers moving 40% of sales merchandise. They operate on two business models. One is first party and third party, effectively deciding when to cooperate or compete in different product segments. And let's assume that Amazon is a purely economic creature, which I think is a fairly safe assumption. That decision of whether to compete or cooperate is driven by probably a few different things. And this particular study found that that decision criteria of whether to enter a segment or not came down to three things consistently, which was sales volume, customer reviews, and ineligibility for fulfillment. And using this data, 
Amazon was able to enter into like 3% of product segments in 10 months. That's pretty quick. So as Mehdi mentioned, I came from Tokyo. Uh, I presume that many of you haven't heard of what we do. So I want to take a minute to introduce myself, if that's all right. My name is Jed Ng. I'm the head of Rakuten Rapid API. My background is in building and scaling new tech ventures. Uh, I work in the startup ecosystem as an investor, an advisor, and a tech stars mentor. I have an MBA from INSEAD, which basically means I pay too much for an education. Uh, if any of you want to reach me, my email and Twitter handle is up here. Just to shed a bit of light on what it is that we do, Rakuten Rapid API is the world's largest API marketplace. Effectively, what we're building is the app store for APIs. The idea is that developers should have a single platform for API discovery to consumption to payment and management. And we operate at a scale today where we have 10,000 APIs, a million users, and we process billions of API calls a month. And we're proud to work with partners like Microsoft, Twilio, and SendGrid, who are already service providers on our platform today. If I had to sum up our mission, it's as follows. For API providers, we want to help API services be successful by reaching a community of a million users, as well as to sell into enterprises. For developers, we want to provide the single API platform for the application lifecycle from discovery all the way to like management. I think we hold a rather unique position in the market in that what's good for us, how we create and capture value, is good for what's all of us in this room today. So three things are fundamentally important to me. First thing is that we need to be able to help API providers be successful even if you're in the long tail, especially if in, in you're in the, in the long tail. Second, the user experience or developer experience today is fought with friction, and the more we can address that, the better. And the third thing is about letting economic forces take hold by letting users, uh, consumers, and, and providers transact with each other. Because if we're not doing that, we can't create value and the whole thing falls apart. And we see both sides uh, of the ecosystem there. And I think it's important to address all of it. So um, that's what I'm going to try and do today uh, by sharing some of our, our views of the API economy. So number one, I want to talk about how APIs as a business model are a relatively new phenomenon. For all of us to, to be here today, we needed a common language, something to communicate in. And the REST framework was that language. Prior to REST, uh, SOAP existed as this industry protocol. Um, and in some ways, REST took over in a grassroots way. Right? Developers favored that for three reasons. One, it was more lightweight. Second, it was more responsive. And JSON is more um, consumable than, than XML. This chart here that you're looking at shows uh, a proxy for global search traffic for the terms REST API versus SOAP. So REST is in blue, and you can see it was about 10 years ago, towards the end of 2008, that REST began to catch up to SOAP in popularity. Extrapolate that data today, and this is what it looks like. It's not even a contest anymore. And around this time, in the last 10 to 14 years, we saw the emergence of APIs as a business model. Today, most of you in this room are familiar with these companies like Twilio, SendGrid, Adyen, and Stripe. They do telephony communications, email delivery, and payment processing using APIs as a vehicle. Today, they're some of the most valuable tech properties in the world today. I think it's safe to say that we've come a long way from Jeff Lawson, who was running around Silicon Valley, trying to raise money from VCs, convincing uh, it, trying to convince investors that developers were a credible buyer segment and that APIs could be used to distribute service. And if I can characterize what we do today, um, we see APIs as a technology for service distribution, number one, and second, as a unit of monetization. And even though we're probably a lot familiar with all of these players um, in these categories, I think it's still early days. I think in the coming years, we are going to see 
more API-based use cases emerge in categories like lead enrichment, where the use case is about um, aggregating data. We are going to see technologies move from general purpose to more use case specific. Uh, I'm particularly excited about EKYC with players like Jumio and Verif and search capabilities uh, because just about every digital service needs that. Number two, the growth of APIs will continue. Depending on what you're following, um, by some estimates, there are up to 30,000 public APIs out there. If you track programmable web's directory, the annual growth rate for the number of APIs is about 40% year on year. And that trend is fairly consistent today. All of this creates a massive discovery problem for users. And that's the, just the first step in their journey. We personally believe that there is space to play for all of these 30,000 users because different API providers who might appear to perform similar functions actually could differ very in very fundamental ways. For example, let's take the case of SMS services. Each provider's uh, performance and their cost structure actually can differ depending on things like where their user base is, how well they've negotiated carry termination, um, and also um, and, and local regulation. Uh, in the case of you know, technologies, depending on things like, uh, let's take a category like artificial intelligence, anything in that stack, computer vision, natural language processing, depending on the data sets on which those models are trained, the results can be vastly different. And then the third thing, depending on your use case, you might be optimizing for cost versus performance, and your decision of which API to use could like, differ depending on that. The other side of this coin is actually what is the implication for API providers? This pie chart here is from Apigee's 2016 State of the API report. The takeaway really is that 90% of API call traffic goes to 10% of API providers. So let's extrapolate that logic out to the general landscape. What it, the story this tells me is that it's exceedingly hard for new API programs or new API providers or new companies distributing services using APIs to be successful. I think somewhere in these thin orange slices are the next like Twilio Sendrids of the world. And if one of you is in this room or actually happened to see this presentation, reach out to me because I want to talk with you. Number three, let's talk about the developer journey. Today, that process for users to find, to manage APIs is fraught with friction. Look at this infograph from like the API days team. It just gives you a small sense of the diversity of this ecosystem. And for users to be able to find all these APIs, it's a pain. But let's say you can process tens of thousands of APIs and you can create a short list of even, let's say, 10 providers. Today, each API provider specialize, is, is highly specialized. They provide one or a handful of APIs, which if we assume there are 30,000 APIs, there might be 10 or 20,000 portals. And each portal is different. It's set up in a different way. And let's assume that everybody had beautiful simple portals, up-to-date documentation, great tooling. This process, this part of the step uh, of, of the user journey is still necessarily manual and time consuming. And that's not there, uh, that's not all. Then you need to get access. It doesn't work in all cases, but um, we see providers that impose uh, approval-based access even when it's not really necessary. Pricing might be opaque, it might require significant financial commitment um, even before you, you do your first API test call. Some API providers have been known to change their policy, deprecate endpoints uh, or throttle usage, and that's not good for any of us. Then for the connection side, uh, users have to contend with poor tooling. Uh, they, they need a way to balance out the performance dependency of using um, a public API and you need to manage stuff. Management, in my opinion, is the most understated like, pain point because 
as long as you're using any of these API services throughout your application lifecycle. It means that you need to manage one account per API provider, you need one API key per API service, you need to make a payment to a provider per month, and you need to track all this stuff on different dashboards. And if we net this all out, take, take this logic, I mean, it, it brings to mind that we have this persistent problem in, in the ecosystem today. I call it the su uh, supply convenience paradox. It's a rather unimaginative name, but just humor me for a minute. And my argument is as follows. Number one, applications benefit from a diverse set of service providers. Number two, applications derive value as they can connect to more and more of these services. But number three, the more API services that you use, the more overhead that imposes, that, that's, a, that's a cost to this. And I argue that this convenience, this overhead, uh, exponentially increases with the amount of API usage. And if you net this all out, the, the logic leads us to conclude that API proliferation today and service specialization on the provider side is actually a friction to making the market. So what's happening out there is that we see technical and business innovations emerge to help solve a lot of this complexity. There's a lot of interest in the market around GraphQL today, and that brings a lot of promise to, to reducing like back-end server load and on the front end, uh, optimize data retrieval so that you get better performance. Um, I want to spend a minute to talk about you know, some business implications. Um, what's particularly interesting to me is that is the value that over-the-top APIs are creating uh, to solve these issues. And the idea here is that service providers can aggregate different multiple API providers of similar function to provide one access point to developers. And it's relevant where users need to like, connect to different services uh, or different accounts. I'll show three quick examples. The first is Plaid. The use case here is in banking service aggregation, where fintech apps need uh, integrations with multiple banks in order to, to pull customer data and to execute transactions. Now, there are over 2,000 retail banks in the US alone. Imagine how difficult it is to do this one by one. As of one year ago, Plaid was valued at $2.6 billion just from aggregating these transactions. In the calendaring and uh, mailbox aggregation space, there are players like Nihilus. And in payment processing, there are companies like uh, Zeus that offer a single interface that allow developers to, to leverage different payment methods uh, cost effectively. I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk about the enterprise perspective. We believe that enterprises have a multifaceted API challenge, which is a nice way to say it, it's really complicated. Um, and there are a few things that I'll talk about. The first one is brand identity. If any of you are thinking, represent organizations looking to external, externalize an API, here are some potentially interesting benchmarks. Now, APIs are a purely digital product. They exist on the internet, and people need to find you. Uh, one way we measure this is the number of, or percentage of API-based keywords going to a domain. And if you look at native API players like Twilio and SendGrid, roughly 0.8% of all their ranked keywords um, have the word containing, uh, sorry, contain API in that. Contrast that with established API programs, that number falls to 0.5%. And for like close partner programs, close API programs that are not generally marketed, uh, that number is fractions of 1%. So think about this. Uh, and what it means for your digital marketing efforts when you go to market. Second, enterprises are increasingly turning to public APIs to build best of breed applications. In an unchecked world, that's a shadow IT problem as this Gartner report talks about. The challenges are that IT departments often have uh, an under-awareness of the extent of public API usage in their organizations. Um, using third-party APIs uh, creates a dependency risk, and if your developers are sharing keys around that, risk breaking multiple applications. 
And if you, don't, if, you have, if you have no visibility into these different API providers, it also means that you're prone to like data breaches. And that's on top of enterprise grade pricing that you're probably giving up by having um, no visibility into this entire process. The next challenge is around internal API usage. Now we talk a lot around the number of public APIs out there. Uh, it's almost our barometer of like how great the industry is doing. But if we look at public a uh, internal APIs, that problem is you know, hundreds or even thousands of times bigger. In 2018, Ping Identity surveyed US high tech firms and they found that 25% of them have over 1,000 internal APIs. That's 3x increase from the year before. So we definitely think that this problem is increasing. What's more troubling is actually how this trend emerges. Internal API adoption in most enterprises starts out like this. It starts with your first mini stack where a developer creates a service, creates a wrapper around it, and builds supporting service. Over time, this mini stack gets replicated. There are forks in the tools uh, and in the portals and different things, and, and this is how it proliferates. Best case, the enterprise is really organized and they have a standard stack, but that rarely ever happens. But eventually, there's this consolidation where different APIs get grouped into different business units, each of them effectively operating their own closed portal, sharing data in a very limited way or not at all with the uh, other business units. And this results in code duplication uh, and many other suboptimal outcomes. Okay, shifting gears again, let's talk about this idea of like APIs of product thinking. Today, most organizations that start API programs, it starts at a very grassroots developer level and often unsupported. The organization creates an API, they create a portal, they put it up and they see what happens. I call this the throw paint on the, on the wall approach. What really needs to happen if you're serious about this is you need to think about APIs as products, right? And you need to do all of these uh, different things to make it successful. And I use the term product because it necess necessitates that we think about technical and business stakeholders coming together. And the way I think about a coherent API program is in a series of layers requiring executive support, having the right team at the operational level, and doing all the right activities at the functional level. The highlighted red boxes tend to be where we see uh, the most gaps or the most common mistakes. Um, for me, I think marketing uh, and that effort is the most significantly uh, unaddressed gap. So I wanna take one level deeper uh, and stay on this with number seven. Step up your marketing game. This list uh, consists all the activities that my team does in offline DevRel and digital marketing. And it's a lot. It's an amount, immense amount of effort to keep up with all of this. And if you're putting together a team, you maybe don't have to solve all of this on day one, but this is what a full scope of activity might look like. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way, and what we've really learned has worked out for us is to be able to string all of these different activities in a co coherent way, number one, and second, to actually build feedback loops into different things to, to get the most performance of any of our marketing efforts. I'll share a couple of quick examples. Number one is about how we work with hackathons, how we reduce our budget and bandwidth load by around 80%. So day one, to get in front of our users, we sponsored local hackathons. We paid our way to get in front of users. Out of these events, we found super fans, um, and they came to talk to us. Out of this, we created a champion program, giving them visible recognition to help them be um, supporters, to be, community build, com to be community builders on our behalf. We optimized on our hackathon operations by creating standardized perk packages, and then it was a matter of time before we linked the two. And now we have community champions in three different countries operating hackathons on our behalf, sometimes without even a local ground team. Uh, we also develop hybrid or remote support models so that we can do uh, more events uh, at lower bandwidth and scale more. 
And what's nice for us is that out of each of these hackathon events, we find more super fans and we build that community from there. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time um, and go to, to the last thing. Talking about working with existing platforms, aggregators as channels for you. And I'll share this from a few different perspectives. You've seen the first three sets of bar graphs on the left talking about user search intent in terms of organic API-based search traffic going to these different domains. If you compare that against aggregators like our site, Rocket and Rapid API, and also Programmable Web, we come in neck and neck. We get about six times higher mind share on search intent for APIs discovery uh, than on, on single API providers. And if you're looking to get started really quickly, there's a lot of existing tools out there, so there's no need to re reinvent the wheel. This is what our portal looks like. It's not the only example out there. There are a lot of great tools out there. Ours happens to be free, and you get access to our community on day one. There's a lot that goes on to build into building a full-fledged portal and to have all the supporting services around it, including uh, billing, payment, and collections. And, and we help you with all of that. And for enterprises, um, something that we've heard from our users is that, great, we love public APIs. We want our developers to access to it. But we don't want this running on public cloud. So what we've taken is actually repackage our public marketplace into an enterprise-grade solution we call Enterprise Hub. It's meant to be a single discovery layer for all your internal APIs. Uh, it also manages consumption and governance. And it integrates with our public marketplace so that uh, your users can get benefits from, you know, uh, best of breed services. And this is a, a company I eventually hope to work with, Huli. <laughs> okay, at least that joke at least worked. <laughs> um, we can also customize the, the UI to have uh, your branding, your look and feel. We can implement uh, SSO and LDAP and role-based access control. Uh, and we do this on-prem or in private cloud for, for different clients. Uh, but that's my time. Thank you for listening. I'll be here all day. If any of you want to connect, please um, reach out to me. I'd love to have a chat. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one question from the Richard Hendricks of the room. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Eric Harsney. I used to be a CEO of Stream Data that I sold to XY, so I was on one of the slides. So what is the link between Rapid API that I know and Rakuten Rapid API? Is that the same thing or is it? Yeah. OK, all right. Uh, so, so the background is that um, we, do, we have a strategic partnership with Rapid API. Effectively, we see this as potentially like a wi winner take all market if we can get the critical mass. So that's what the partnership is about. One more question. Yeah. Where is the end? Okay, sorry. That's good. Yeah. Um, I was interested in when you said um, application leaders should monitor outbound API usage. What's the actual architectural um, what, what would you put in to, to be able to do that automatically? Just to, to monitor API. How would monitor um, yeah. outbound API usage. Sure. So, so we do this in, in two ways. Um, on our portal, uh, we, we want to show transparency around API performance. right? So we show um, three performance statistics. One is a popularity score rated by users. We also show uh, real-time runtime layer data on um, latency and, and call success rates. So I'm not sure if that I answered the question correctly. Correct. Yeah, so we see it as a proxy layer above the uh, API provider. So it in the, your API can integrate directly into the hub. Uh, or um, through integrates with the, the gateway. 
So we meet with. So the question is like how, uh, um, so company monitors what's come in, but also monitors, and so how do you think company should monitors what goes out of the company, right? You know, the traffic out. Usually gateways do that on two sides, right? Sure. Uh, so, but except of answering, yeah, gateways do that on two sides. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do you have any clue about uh, maybe how Rapid API monitors all the traffic that goes outside its platform? Yeah, um, so can we take that discussion offline? Yeah. I'd love to have yeah. a discussion, actually. Yeah, so uh, let's keep it uh, offline for the break. Thank you, Jed. Thank you, Jay and G, for, for, for you. your presentation.